If, as we've seen last time, rural Russia, life of peasants was changing in dramatic ways and also, in many ways, deeply traditional still uh, in the early part of the 20th century, latter part of the 19th century, it was in the city during these years that we see the most dramatic evidence of a really different Russia in many ways uh, emerging, different economically, different socially, uh, different culturally, and that's the subject of this lecture. In thinking about what's happening in Russia's cities, it's actually useful if we return to an idea I mentioned some time ago, the notion of a public sphere, uh, something emerging really since the late 18th century. Now, in the classic definition of this public sphere, this is a social space uh, that exists in any society, or doesn't exist in many societies, at least very extensively. A sphere that exists between private life, between family life, uh, and the life of the state, the formally uh, political life. In other words, it's the civic uh, sphere between the individual uh, and the state. It's organized, uh, it has various institutions, where people can come together. And very importantly, people can participate in this public civic life uh, without repression, without coercion. They're free to come uh, together uh, and gather. And in this space is where public opinions, where citizens' ideas about the future of their country, and even of local issues, are expressed and often even decided. Most importantly, of course, historians have long argued that this public sphere is the essential foundation for a democratic society and exists in all societies that really develop uh, modern uh, democracy. Here's the place where civic democracy uh, can thrive even before the state has fully reformed itself in a democratic way. And it's said without such a vital civic sphere, a public sphere, uh, democratic society and the possibility of democracy suffocates uh, and dies. In Russia, in the late 1800s, and especially in the years after the reforms that we've talked about before of 1905-1906, it is clear that such a public sphere is truly flourishing, especially in the urban areas. One major sign of this is the really rapid development of the press uh, in early 20th century Russia. Commercial newspapers with wide circulation uh, began to appear, especially in the years after 1905, some of which had very influential journalists who helped give a voice uh, to public life, to help shape public opinion uh, in many ways, and echoed views that were being talked about in civic, these civic spaces. Magazines uh, began to appear for various particular uh, interests and tastes uh, and levels uh, of education, including, as I mentioned, the hugely popular uh, literary, uh, illustrated magazines written for, published for lower class uh, audiences that covered the whole story of the world. Thick journals uh, proliferated, serious, heavy, unillustrated intellectual journals filled uh, with complex ideas. And the book publishing market uh, expanded very rapidly uh, in these years, including books for uh, popular readers, for lower class readers. A second sign, major sign, of this flourishing public sphere was, was the proliferation of voluntary associations, uh, civic organizations designed to promote uh, the public in interest, the sort of organizations that you may know that Alexis de Tocqueville, a uh, famous French uh, aristocrat and observer of world politics in the mid-19th century, described in his famous book, Democracy in America, as the truest foundation of democratic life emerging in uh, the United States, uh, these voluntary associations which seemed so proliferating uh, then. In Russia one sees something similar though much later obviously, late 19th, early 20th century. Charities, for example, uh, proliferated, organized by noblemen, by rich merchants, uh, by members of the royal family, all engaged in public activities. Service organizations began to proliferate. Organizations like the Moscow Literacy Society, or various societies to promote useful public amusements, as they were uh, called. Many of them, not surprisingly, concerned with the public amusements already found in the villages, but also in the cities. Societies to disseminate useful le uh, knowledge, uh, temperance societies, Bible societies, and hundreds of similar organizations existing in every city uh, in Russia uh, by the early 1900s. Business and professional societies also began uh, to form, and many of them gathered in congresses and exhibitions, published their own uh, journals and, and newspapers. Uh, merchants organized professional organizations. So did factory owners, 
publishers, uh, journalists, uh, doctors gathered together in their own or organization, uh, legal specialists, jurists, uh, teachers, engineers, uh, and others. Uh, and after 1905, all of these were joined uh, by political parties, which were now finally legal, uh, covering the whole spectrum from uh, moderate socialists uh, to monarchists. Also, organizations, civic organizations, began to proliferate among the urban lower classes. Uh, before 1905, these existed especially in the form of a variety of types of mutual aid societies, burial societies, where workers would share money to help cover the funeral of one of their, their members, uh, mutual assistance funds in case one became unemployed or needy in other ways due to illness or injury at work, cultural societies uh, of all uh, s sorts. And after 1905, these were joined by uh, trade unions, which were legalized in 1906, and an enormous proliferation of cultural clubs uh, where workers got together to talk, to drink tea, to read literature, to see performances, uh, to sing, various ways they came together as a type of free public. There were also various non-governmental forms of, of education beginning to proliferate uh, in these years. Private schools, private institutes, uh, private charity schools for uh, lower class uh, Russians and all over the country began to appear what were called people's universities, places where lower class Russians, mainly workers, uh, artisans and others could go and hear lectures from often prominent scholars of their day, join reading circles, participate in amateur theatrical uh, productions and the like. Also relevant in terms of spaces where a diverse public could gather and feel itself to be emerging as a public were various forms of public entertainment that began to be developed by not the state but by private individuals uh, in Russia's uh, cities in the early part especially of the 20th century and even more after 1905. Uh, what were called pleasure gardens began to appear uh, in the summer in most big cities where there would be fairs and rides and booths and all sorts of exciting uh, activities that one could wander about uh, and if one had a little bit of change uh, afford to truly enjoy. Music halls uh, began uh, to appear, cabarets mainly for the middle classes uh, where performances were often modeled after music halls and cabarets to be found uh, in Western Europe. Circuses uh, existed in every uh, major city and it wasn't just the normal circus performance but also other public activities including the most popular uh, wrestling matches that were held on the, the floor of the circus. Uh, and cinemas began to proliferate in this emerging public space especially in cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow they were often showing western uh, films, silence, travelogues were very popular, newsreels, but increasingly after 1912, Russian films, though the westernness of these places was always important. They tended to have names, for example, to mention two of the most popular theaters uh, in St. Petersburg, like Parisiana, which actually still exists in Petersburg, or the Crystal Palace, a sense of being part of the world through cinema. Of course, none of this existed without the typical resistance uh, of the state. Police, especially the secret political police, watched every civic organization, and if it became political, shut it down. The press was always subject to censorship. Uh, newspapers uh, were subject to censorship before publication. So certain political things couldn't be said. And every thicker work, a book or a fatter journal, uh, would be censored afterwards. If it said something illegal, it would be brought before a court uh, and fined and perhaps shut down. And of course, none of the civic life had much influence on the policies of the state. It was vital and alive and engaging, but the state was going along making policies without much influence by public opinion. Still, with all these caveats still present, we can see in many ways a modern society, a modern urban society is emerging uh, in Russia. Growing industry, growing industrial classes, growing cities, growing civic sphere, and an increasingly cosmopolitan culture. However, this modernity, this urban modernity, this thriving public sphere also had a very dark, space, a dark face, especially in urban areas. Uh, the Russian city was a place of excitement and opportunity and possibility. It was also a place filled with danger uh, and problems. Uh, and one could see this most clearly by picking up the daily newspapers of major Russian cities uh, in these early uh, years before uh, World War I. For example, if you 
were sitting in St. Petersburg and picked up one of the major dailies in 1910, you might read articles filled with encouraging reports that make you think Russia was heading in a positive direction if you were uh, a liberal-minded, educated Russian, as many were. Stories, for example, about the spread of scientific knowledge and technical uh, know-how about new inventions would appear and how these were being adapted in Russia. Stories of entrepreneurial success, how individuals built uh, build businesses, stories about upward social mobility, and very importantly for many uh, urban readers, want ads that would give you a chance to read about jobs that you could have that would improve uh, your lot. There was a great deal of reporting about all these various institutions of civic life uh, that I've been describing. There were even articles about how wonderful it is to live in a city, the civilizing effects of living in streets that weren't covered with mud, around buildings that had beautiful facades, and streets that were laid out in an orderly way. But you'd also, in these newspapers, read much more troubling stories about city life, uh, stories likely to make you think about degeneration rather than uh, pro progress. Danger, you would learn, was ubiquitous in a Russian city. Streetcars, for example, one of the great symbols of modern uh, life, uh, would suddenly, you would often read in the paper, leap off their tracks and kill somebody or maim somebody. For one example, in 1910 in St. Petersburg, a streetcar slipped off its tracks and ran over a peasant who was in the city working as a cook, trying to advance himself, severing both of his legs. In response, an infuriated crowd, tired of hearing these sorts of stories, ended up jumping on the streetcar, pulling off uh, the driver and severely beating him. Elevators, you would read in the press, suddenly crashed to the ground. Buildings in the midst of construction suddenly collapsed. Fires broke out inexplicably. Uh, you'd be reading the paper and you'd hear about mad dogs for no particular reason roaming about the cities and biting innocent passers-by. Uh, you'd read about debauched men uh, preying on women and children. You'd read about women, uh, poor and desperate, lured into prostitution to survive prostitution, which was legalized to regulate it in particular to protect uh, the uh, health and, and the spread of, in particular, syphilis. Mysterious bodies, you'd read in the paper, are suddenly discovered floating in the river or in the canal or in the edge of the city. Uh, you'd read about disease in the city, syphilis and cholera and typhus, much worse than in any rural uh, area. And at night, you would read in the papers, thieves were at work uh, everywhere, breaking into apartments, mugging people uh, on the streets. Now, these are facts. These things truly happen, but very important for the readers of these stories, these were indeed stories written about, exaggerated, overemphasized, thought about, part of the image of what you felt urban life was about. Very troubling, you also would learn in reading from the press is in the city, you don't know who to trust. For example, a well-dressed gentleman and lady, it was said in an article, Petersburg, 1910 again, might walk into a store, suggest that they would like to buy a very nice uh, fur coat. They were well-dressed. You figured they had the money if you were a sales clerk. When the sales clerk turns uh, his or her back, they would run off uh, with the goods. Such stories were very common. Just because people looked dre well-dressed didn't mean they were moral or even wealthy. The city is full of disguises. Or another story from 1910. A merchant is walking down the streets of St. Petersburg, the street being, of course, at the center of civic life and also a symbol of the dangers of the city. Walking down the street and two well-dressed women, it's always said that they're well-dressed in these stories, uh, come up to him. One of the women greet him very warmly, oh, it's so good to see you, and begins kissing him on the lips. Meanwhile, the other woman walks behind him and begins to find his wallet and pull it out. He tries to scream, but the other woman only, only kisses him more intensely. They get away uh, with his money. Other events are much more dangerous than this. Uh, it's often said how, again, a well-dressed man walks up to a passerby, asks him for the time, and while he's looking at his watch, uh, pulls out a knife and stabs him. Maybe robs him, maybe just runs away. Appearances in the city are deceptive. This is something you'd learn in reading the papers. Another major urban problem was what was called widely in the press hooliganism, seen as characteristic of urban life. These included a whole variety of public street crimes, uh, or just outrageous behaviors, as you'll see, in which mainly young men, 
sort of working class street toughs on the whole, would threaten uh, respectable pr pedestrians, uh, harass them, sometimes physically uh, assault them. And newspapers invariably describe these events as not just crime, but as assault on civilized respectability, something that was seen as fragile uh, and in, in risk, at risk. Many hooligan acts were really meant, as this comment and as this interpretation suggests, to outrage, uh, to annoy the new urban middle class, the new urban bourgeoisie. Uh, a young working class tough or a group of them might be walking down the street, see somebody well dressed, and simply walk up and bump against them just to be annoying. Uh, especially if it was a woman, they enjoy doing it even more. Uh, groups of hooligans, sometimes drunk, would block whole sidewalks even in the center of cit the city, swearing loudly at people, singing body songs, just making a nuisance uh, of themselves. Uh, grab. Uh, uh, Gangs of these youths would sometimes walk up behind a well-dressed woman and pull the ribbons out of her hair. Or perhaps they would show a little flip book with pornographic images in it, just to annoy. Or in one case, a rather one might say, in a strange way, creative group of hooligans climbed onto a streetcar with a, a wasp nest, threw it on the floor, and as the wasp spread, spread and began stinging people, ran out and escaped, laughing all the way. This hooliganism was sometimes not so funny. It could be very violent and dangerous as well. Uh, stabbings, uh, muggings were often described as hooliganisms. Uh, especially, sometimes these were robberies, but it was more likely to be called hooliganism when these stabbings seemed to have no purpose, no rhyme or reason. Somebody was said to be stabbed and their wallet was still uh, in their pocket. Uh, this senselessness was seen to be characteristic of hooliganism. There were also darker notes to be heard uh, in the press. Death was seen as a pervasive part of urban life. The daily press is filled with accounts of accidental death by tram, by automobile, by bad food, by falling elevators. Uh, the press was filled with accounts of very high infant mortality rates uh, in the city and with accounts, as I've said, of various diseases such as cholera, which were said often to be characteristic of modern urban uh, congestion and poor sanitation. And especially the press was filled with stories of murder and suicide. Murders, in fact, were reported with frightening or maybe numbing regularity uh, in the press of the big cities of Russia. Popular daily papers offered readers a sort of grisly procession of knifings and beatings and stranglings uh, involving all classes of people uh, and all age groups, both men uh, and women. Various causes were cited uh, in the press. Many said these were connected with theft, uh, with material greed, some elaborated. In other words, with part of the rising materialism of modern urban Russian life. Murder was also said to result from uncontrolled emotions, anger and jealousy and revenge, or even simply nervous stress, which again, some commentators noted, were part of living in a modern city. At the same time, Many readers were told, and again, even more emblematic of the characteristics of what many described as the nature of Russia's modernity, many murders had no purpose whatsoever. Uh, these hooligan attacks where someone was killed with no reason at all. Often, a more essential but vaguer cause uh, was given, but all of the same sort of argument, namely the nature of the modern uh, city, the existential nature of urban, industrial, modern uh, life in Russia. For example, in, in the words of one Petersburg journalist writing in the same year of 1910 in St. Petersburg, a man who liked to call himself the wanderer, for he wandered about and observed life. He said, I am a cultured person, something many of his readers would have agreed with, but here in the city, side by side with me lives a savage, and I might become his victim. Now, while murder seemed to characterize the dangers of the new urban society, uh, suicide seemed to reveal its darkest uh, inner soul. Papers often reported tragic suicides, especially by young people in the city, and dwelled frequently on suicide as a characteristic sign of the malady of the modern age, uh, of the malady of urban life, the problem with where Russia seemed to be heading. The majority of suicides, in fact, occurred at home, but what really attracted the attention of the press were these many suicides that took place in public, in a way, the dark side of this public uh, sphere, of this civic life. M suicides in restaurants, 
suicides in city parks, suicides where people jumped off the bridges of, in Sa of St. Petersburg into the canals and rivers, suicides right out of high apartment uh, windows onto the street before, public suicides usually in broad uh, daylight. Here was truly a dark side of this emerging civic life. Now, although the reasons for suicides were typically described in the newspaper reports that masses of urban Russians were reading as unclear, journalists who commented on these stories tended to always point in the same place, the nature of modern urban life, of Russia's transformation into an urban modern uh, society. For example, one writer, a woman named Olga Gridina, uh, who worked for a very popular St. Petersburg newspaper called Gazeta Kapieka, which means the Kopek Gazette, the penny newspaper, uh, in other words, said that the main cause of this proliferation of suicides in Russia was simply the life of the modern city. Uh, at one point, she's writing about a very well-known story in which three young female students who had come from the provinces to advance themselves in St. Petersburg to study in its university uh, committed suicide together in their apartment, dressed in white dresses, with Chopin's funeral march on the piano, all very dramatic and often discussed. She said, why did these people, why did these women with all this possibility in the world depart from life? And her answer is, their youthful spirits thirsted for something elevated, ideal and great, but reality was bland and empty. And readers understood reality meant the reality of life in the modern urban capital like Petersburg. Or in another case, about another suicide, the same uh, journalist and commentator, uh, Olga Gridna, wrote, if one could count the numbers who sorrow and suffer in cities, humanity would shudder. In other words, for urban dwellers, city life was indeed full of excitement and possibility and, and, and opportunity, but it was also a place filled with danger and fear, uh, anxiety, and a sense of doubt about where Russia uh, was heading. One, of course, could see this in pondering the political news uh, as well that appeared in newspapers. Uh, the promise of civil rights, the, the uh, work of the, the Duma, the power of the, of the new legislature, but also in the limited power of the Duma and the police supervision of all of this civic life could also lead one to this uncertain meaning of modern uh, life. And, of course, we see the same in everyday street life, everyday city life that people were reading about so often. I want to conclude by looking still more deeply into this new uh, urban life, by looking at it from the perspective of the newest type of city dweller, the one who had become indeed so important, already was important in 1905, and so important in the history of 1917, namely the industrial worker. There's a lot of stories one could tell about uh, urban workers in Russia in the early 20th century, uh, stories workers told about themselves, uh, or people writing about workers. One, of course, is the obvious story of workers' hardships in this new modern industrial city, the difficulties of migration from the village, uh, terrible living and working uh, conditions, deep uh, poverty. Another is the story of the possibilities, the pleasures of being in the city and no longer back in the village. Uh, indeed, many workers were quite pleased to be in the city, however poor their lives seemed to be. They were so much better than life in the village. Uh, and they found something exciting about city life. The swearing and the arguing and the hawking of goods in the, in the public marketplaces, the noise of the streets, the glow of the lamplights at night, uh, the sounds of the factory whistles, the rhythms of the drive uh, belts, uh, the heroism for many of strikes and demonstrations, all seemed to suggest that some new world was emerging uh, for many workers, as we know from their own writings, since workers were indeed much more literate than peasants. Indeed, related to that is the story we could also tell that was often told of workers uh, awakening uh, their growing literacy. Most urban workers could read and write by the, in the years after 1905. Or one could tell the stories often told of their growing personal pride that came from learning a very difficult industrial skill and learning to survive in the city. The story of their rising expectations, of their exposure uh, to new ideas from the reading that they did, from the conversations they had with others. And, of course, the evidence of all these changes in the rising labor movement uh, and uh, growing membership in left-wing socialist parties. The story of their awakening, as socialists tended to call it. 
Now, to better understand all these stories, and all of these are parts of a whole, these large historical trends, let me suggest we listen to workers' own words in trying to describe how they felt about the world around them, what they de the desired. Uh, one important body of words that tell us something about workers' own perspective, something we lack for peasants, are collective demands, uh, especially those that were presented during strikes or uh, periods leading up to a strike. Many of the demands, when workers got together and wrote, got, found somebody to write up a list of demands that they'd present to the manager or the owner of their uh, factory or shop, tended to be uh, the usual sort of economic or political demands uh, that one would have heard uh, in 1905. We're now talking about the years after 1905 especially. Higher wages, they would call for. Shorter hours, uh, cleaner uh, bathrooms, uh, less dangerous machinery. And they would usually throw in the political demand for civil rights. Uh, for the lack of police supervision of unions uh, and the like. Many of these collective demands by workers were focused on what might be called moral uh, issues. We've seen this in 1905, for example. A very common demand was for polite address, that workers should not be treated like children or animals and called ty, the informal you in Russian, but should be spoken to with respect. Uh, and in fact, workers often described ordinary economic demands, uh, demands for uh, greater sanitation in the bathroom, for safer machinery, uh, for higher wages, uh, for hot water provided for tea. They described these as demands that had to do with something more fundamental than improved conditions, but was about their right, as workers like to say, to live as human beings. Indeed, this phrase, the right to live like a human being, would be heard more and more uh, in these demands. A deeper source of how these important growing class of workers felt about their world could be found in their diaries, uh, in personal letters that they wrote, uh, in essays that uh, sometimes appeared in the trade union press or the party uh, political press, again, coming from the most concerned and active and articulate uh, among them. And what, notice, what one notices even in private diaries and letters uh, is also the centrality of these moral issues, these dignity uh, issues. Uh, consider some of the phrases one often finds in these writings. Workers have the right to live as human beings, as we saw in the collective demands as well. We are machines. We are not machines. We are human beings. We are not slaves. We are not cattle. We are not camels. These sort of phrases kept being heard. A and sometimes workers talked because they had listened to socialists and picked up this vocabulary, talked about the exploitation of the working class. But far more often, especially in their private remarks, uh, workers would talk about despotism and cruelty and rudeness and insult and injury. And finally, and I need not explain the importance of this to you, we've seen it so often, though mainly out of the mouths of intellectuals up until this period, workers often justified their protests as a defense of leechness, of the human person, of the self, this Russian uh, word that suggests both the nature of human beings as human uh, and also uh, the natural rights that result from this. In fact, some of the most interesting uh, and in some ways remarkable uh, expressions of workers' aspirations uh, come in uh, their own poetry. Almost all workers who became literate wrote some poetry, and many wrote a great deal of poetry. They're reading, they're thinking, they're trying to express themselves. It's not very good literature. I don't recommend it to you as high literature, but it tells us something very deep about their feelings about the world around them, and thus about the nature of that world we're trying to understand. Probably the most major theme one finds in workers' poetry uh, in these years before 1914 is the suffering individual, the suffering self. Uh, workers wrote constantly, for example, about the anguish of a mother, a working class mother, watching her children starve. They wrote about their own childhoods ruined and lost, uh, by the hardships of lower class life, whether back in the village or growing up in the city. They wrote about the sexual abuse of working women by foremen uh, and employers, uh, where women, as it was said, uh, their feelings of human dignity are being trampled in the dirt. Uh, and of course, they wrote about what they endured at work, low wages and dirt and violence from foremen, uh, maimings uh, by machines. The solution for many of these workers, and this group would play such a key role in the events to come, was fairly clear. A society and a political system that did one thing, respected 
the natural human dignity in all people. As we'll see when we get into the post-revolutionary period, this is a question they continue to ask about the regime that they eventually got. In other words, again, just as in talking about the intelligentsia, we come back to this critical idea of human dignity. Uh, and on the one hand, we can see that urban life Modern urban civilization allowed this human nature, this leechness, this self to thrive. It was a city filled with opportunities at every turn. On the other hand, it was a place filled with humiliations uh, and indignities uh, as well. Or on the one hand, to use a worker's own words uh, in a, from a poem, one can find in the city the cradle of the happy future life. And you've seen so much signs of that. On the other hand, in the words of another worker, the city is nothing but a cruel abyss that swallows up life uh, and light. As in so much else we've seen, it's the contradictory possibilities of Russian life that is the one most consistent thing we can see in Russia on the eve of war uh, and revolution. We'll see the same even more clearly as we look at culture, uh, cultural life in late imperial Russia, uh, the subject of the next lecture.